Okay. Now we begin, I begin my text with the book of Acts, 17th chapter and 26th verse. And hath made of one blood all, na all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Now, contrary to popular belief, the transatlantic slave trade was not the introduction of people of Africa to the word of the Bible and the word of Christianity. The Bible itself is filled with mention of Ethiopia and its people, such as the Ethiopian Queen Candace, mentioned in Acts 8.27, the Queen of Sheba in 1 Kings 10, Takara, the King of Ethiopia in 2 Kings 19, as well as the Ethiopian eunuch mentioned in Jeremiah 38, just to name a few. Congregations existed in Ethiopia as early as the 400s AD, long before the Christian religion had penetrated many parts of Northern Europe. So contrary to popular belief, people often speak of Christianity as the white man's religion. Well, there's plenty of evidence of that, far to the contrary, to put it mildly. Now, the first known Africans that were brought here to America were brought in 1526, along with the Spanish explorer Juan Luis Vasquez de Alion, to what we now know as Georgetown, South Carolina. And then, some, and then in 1670, they came to Charleston on a ship called the Three Brothers with Captain Nathaniel Sale. And along that ship came three Africans, John, John Jr., and Elizabeth. Well, those were the English names. And, and so they were brought here primarily to grow rice. You see, over in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in West Africa, you had these tribes such as the Mendes, the Kises, and very importantly for our area, the Golas. And because of the isolation of this area, many of these Africans kept more of their African speech, folkways, and culture than any group of Africans brought to the United States. And that is where we get the Gullah dialect and culture of this region. Now, also contrary to popular belief, the people who were here in slavery as blacks were not completely illiterate or ignorant, as many of them would have you believe. You see, early on, we were involved with the church. In Philadelphia, you had a man by the name of Richard Allen, who, along with some black members, were members of the St. George Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. But in those dark days, black people had to take communion after the whites finished. But he refused to leave the, he was supposed to leave when they told him not to take communion with the whites. And so he led the African Americans out of that church and he formed Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. And that is where we of the African Methodist Episcopal denomination have our origin. Now, meanwhile, as that was going on, in 1788, down in Savannah, Georgia. They started the oldest known continuous black church in America, which is First African Baptist Church. One of the founders of that was a man from right here in Charleston, a former slave by the name of Andrew Bryan, who has relatives in the West Ashley area to this very day. And that church was also where runaways were sheltered during the days of slavery. So it formed multiple purposes. Here in Charleston, they had a church called the Hempstead African Church that was over on Hanover Street on Charleston's east side. And there was a class leader or a lay preacher in that church by the name of Denmark Vesey, who tried to start the Great Slave Rebellion of 1822. And he did that using Exodus 21:16, he that stealeth a man and selleth him shall be put to death, and Revelation 13:10 he that leadeth into captivity shall be led into captivity. To make a long story short, his plan was exposed and he was executed. But not too long after that happened, there was Bishop Daniel Alexander Payne, who had a school for free and enslaved children on 125 Trad Street downtown. Because Denmark Vesey used the Bible and history books to encourage the rebellion, the state of South Carolina made it illegal 
to teach African Americans, free or enslaved, to read and write. So he fled to Wilberforce, Ohio, where he formed Wilberforce University, which was the first black college in America that was run by African Americans. One of his graduates was a man named Reverend Richard Harvey Kane. Richard Harvey Kane came down here after slavery ended and after they, the fall of the Confederacy, and he took the what was left of the congregation of the Hempstead Church and he founded a new church. He purchased land on 110 Calhoun Street and he named it after the Hebrew word for God is with us, which is Emmanuel. And he said that this would be the mother of the new black churches in Charleston. And that is how Mother Emmanuel AME came into being. Now, also during this period, about 1888 or so, the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass came to Charleston and he spoke at the church that was the outgrowth of Mother Emanuel, which is Mount Zion AME, which is over on Glebe Street. And he told the congregation these words. He said that while he was a slave, he prayed and prayed and prayed in his corner that God would set him free. But he said that his prayers were never answered until he got up and you prayed with his legs. In other words, as is said in the book of James, faith without works is dead. And also at Mother Emanuel, Martin Luther King made his first appearance in Charleston on April the 12th, 1962. And while he was there, during the time when we were trying to register and get our voting rights, he told the congregation these words in that inevitable baritone of his, if the Negroes of South Carolina would have voted numbers equal to their population, I say to you that from the governor on down, they will sing a new tune when it comes to the liberation of this people. The governor at that time was a man that many of you probably knew personally, who later became senator, Ernest Fritz Hollis. Oh, yeah. And 24 years later, January 20th, 1986, when I was at the University of South Carolina, the state of South Carolina had its first King Day celebration at the state capitol, and the featured speaker of that day was former governor, Ernest Fritz Hollis. How's that for prophecy? <laughs> Dr. King's second appearance was in Charleston at the old county hall, where many of you probably went to wrestling matches and rock and roll shows back in the 60s and 70s. And while he came to Charleston on that date, June, June 30, July 30, 1967, many feared that he may be assassinated right here in Charleston because the sentiment against him was so great. He was actually killed in Memphis some eight months later. But on the stage with him was our current congressman, James Clyburn, when he was a young man, and a man named Herbert U. Fielding, who would later be a state senator and was a funeral director. I interviewed Mr. Fielding about that in 1999, some uh, 16 years before he passed. And he told me that when Dr. King came on stage, there was an unstable man in the balcony who had a light bulb, and he threw it into the audience and it went pow, like a rifle shot. And everybody on stage was wondering what was happening to Dr. King, but Dr. King did not flinch. He stared directly into the congregation, continuing to speak as if nothing happened because he had that much faith in what he was doing and that much control over his emotions. All that through faith. And one really interesting story that I would like to conclude with in this homily this morning is as follows. As many of you know, on June the 17th, 2015, the terrorist Dylan Roof entered Mother Emanuel and assassinated my friend, the Reverend Clemente Pinckney, and eight members of the congregation. What did not appear in the press was the following incident that I witnessed with my own eyes that sums up the message for this morning. About two days after this took place, over 10,000 of us gathered at Mother Emanuel and clapped and sing and prayed and let the world know that we were not afraid to go back into that church. And as this was going on, I heard a foreign sound emerge from the middle of the street. And lo and behold, it was the Jewish community of Charleston 
They gathered together in a circle on Calhoun Street in front of Mother Emanuel, and they began to recite the Hebrew prayer of the dead to show their solidarity with us during that time. And I, that really touched my heart, and I try to tell that story often when it comes to discussing Mother Emanuel, because it is the living embodiment of the following scripture, which goes as follows. Psalm 133rd chapter, in the first verse, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Thank you. Amen.